Welcome to Recovery at Cokesbury. My name's Terry. I'm a believer in Jesus Christ and I struggle with codependency. We're so glad you decided to join us. We want you to know a few things about who we are, what we do, and why we're here. We love Jesus and we've seen Him work miracles. You can be the next miracle. This is a safe place to learn, share, and ask questions. Recovery at Cokesbury is for anyone dealing with chemical addiction, compulsive behavior, loss, relationship issues, or life challenges. Scripture is the foundation for our teaching. The 12 steps are based on Scripture and our daily tools for recovery. We encourage participation with AA, NA, and Al-Anon. We want to encourage you to be part of Recovery at Cokesbury at Cokesbury Church on Thursday nights. The address is 9915 Kingston Pike in Knoxville, Tennessee. Dinner starts at 5.30, followed by large group worship and learning at 6.30. Open share groups meet at 7.45. True change and healing begin in those open share groups. For information about the groups we offer, please keep an eye on our website, recoveryatcokesbury.com. Thanks for joining us. We're confident you made the right decision. You will be understood, respected, and loved here.
Jesus is waiting for God's soul of the world. Step one, we admitted we were powerless over our addictions and compulsive behaviors, that our lives had become unmanageable. I see there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to the brokenness that is still within me. Romans 7, 23. Step two, we came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity. When we were powerless to help ourselves, God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us. We are daily delivered from brokenness and strongholds through life with Jesus. Romans 5, 6, and 10. Step three, we made a decision to turn our will and life over to the care of God. Therefore, I urge you in the view of God's mercy, offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. Romans 12, 1. Step four, we made a searching and fearless moral inventory of ourselves. Let us test and examine our ways and let us return to the Lord. Lamentations 340. Step five, we admitted to God, to ourselves and to another human being the exact nature of our wrongs. Confess to one another your faults, your slips, your false steps and your offenses and pray also for one another that you may be healed. James 5.16. Step six, we were entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Change your mind and purpose. Turn around and return to God that your sins may be erased, blotted out and wiped clean. Acts 3.19. Step seven, we humbly ask God to remove our shortcomings. If we confess our sins to God, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all of our unrighteousness. 1 John 1, 9. Step eight, we had made a list of all persons we had harmed and became willing to make amends to them all. Search me, God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. Point out anything wicked or hurtful in me that offends you and lead me along the path of everlasting life. Psalms 139, 23, 24. Step nine, we may direct amends to such people wherever possible, except when to do so would injure them or others. Therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and remember that someone has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar. First, go and be reconciled to your brother or sister, then come and offer your gift. Matthew 5, 23, 24. Step 10, we continue to take personal inventory and when we were wrong, promptly admitted it. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. Romans 12, two. Step 11, we sought through prayer and meditation to improve our conscious contact with God praying only for knowledge of His will for us and the power to carry that out. If it is true that you look favorably on me, let me know your ways so I may understand you more deeply, intimately, and fully, and continue to enjoy your favor. Exodus 33, 13. And step 12, having had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps, we tried to carry this message to others and to practice these principles in all our affairs. My dear friends, if you know people who have wandered off from God's truth, don't write them off, go after them, get them back and you will have rescued precious lives from destruction and prevented an epidemic of wandering away from God. James 5, 19, 20.
Amen. Let's pray together. Sweet Jesus, Lord, we thank you for this time together in this room. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for being honest with us. And we thank you for your Holy Spirit who comes here to be with us tonight to show us what your love for us is all about and to show us what free living is all about. We pray for Matt and his family, Lord, that you just surround them with your love and care and your strong arms and that you walk them through these days and weeks and months and bring a fullness to them and, a, and a, an understanding of their hearts that's so powerful. In your sweet name we pray, amen. So step six, you know, we call that, I mean, you think of step six as kind of being like, I have only, in my whole life, it's almost unbelievable, but in my whole life, I've only had like, I've only had one sort of quote, unquote surgery. I can't believe it, but that's true. And it was like, I had two different deals with eyes um, along the way, retinas. I had all kinds of, I had one retina detach, got that fixed and all that, and had another retina detach a couple years later, went through all that, um, had the second one detach again. So all those were, that's the sum total of surgeries that I've had, but when you go there, you know, they have you sign a consent form, right? That you're willing to have this, this um, you're willing to authorize this surgery. And in this sixth step, what we're authorizing God to do is to do surgery on our hearts. And we're authorizing God to do surgery on the character defects of our hearts, you know? So the surgery is gonna come in the next step, but that's what we're authorizing God to do in this step. I became entirely ready to have God remove all these defects of character. Where do I find these defects of character? Well, hopefully I've, put, I've begun to understand some of my defects of character as I've worked the fourth step, right? As I've done a searching and fearless moral inventory of my life, I'm beginning to uncover these are some of the things about me that now make sense. This is the stuff that um, has caused me to not have freedom in my life. This is the stuff that has caused me problems with myself, right? Problems with others, problems with life. And so I begin to uncover those. One of the things that's important about building that list of character defects in my fourth step is that in the fifth step, God, the re there's a reason why we share with myself, somebody else, and God what I learned in my fourth step, right? Because in that fifth step, you know, it's, there's more to that, I think anyway, than God just sitting there and patently listening to your list, right? At some point, I would hope that there is gonna be an exchange and that God is gonna also speak and that God is gonna start trying to show you, look, this thing that you wrote down here about yourself, is that really your character defect or is that what somebody else has told you is you? You know, and so we get to some truth, right? Because it's easy, I think it's easy with, a, with us that have had compulsions to begin to bring the whole mountain of character defects down on ourselves because there's so much, there's so much guilt that we're living with, right? And there's so much responsibility that we're trying to claim for literally everything under the sun and there's so much shame that we struggle with that when we start to do a fourth step, if there are, in this one list I've got, there's about that many, 300 and some character defects that are identified, we think we have 320 of them, right? But the fact of the matter is, you know, that's a, that's a misplaced perception, and God does get to weigh in on the truth about us, right, in that sixth step and go, well, let's examine that. I know, that, I know that your mom says that about you. I know that your dad says that about you. I know that your ex says that about you. I know that your sister does. I know that your brother does, your friend at work does. I know you got all this influence coming your way, but because it's an influence doesn't mean it's true. Because somebody is trying to speak into your life doesn't mean that it's true, amen? And when it comes to character defects, you've gotta be able to examine those with somebody that is in the program that has some recovery, that's able to be objective, that's able to ask you objective questions about, do you think that is really true about you? 
The step six prayer says this, God, help me become willing, sign the authorization, help me become willing to let go of all the things to which I still cling. Help me to be ready to let you remove all of these defects that your will and purpose may take their place. Amen. And so character defects, I mean like the big, the big uh, sort of ticket areas that we can talk about are kind of like, here are some of them anywhere, and then there's a lot more. But resentment and anger is obviously, you know, it's obviously a piece of character defect that we know a lot about, right? I mean, I would put that on the top of the hit parade for relapse fuel. I'd put all these, not necessarily in this order, but I would put all these on the ticket of being resource fuel capable, amen? Character defects have a capacity to derail our recovery. There's a reason why it's not like God's like, well, I, I wanna work on Mark Beebe's character defects because I just want him to be a better person. It's like God is trying to say, I need to work on your character defects because they're gonna, they're gonna affect your sobriety, right? They're gonna, they're gonna impact your sobriety because every one of these is a source or a fuel for relapse, amen? Every one of these is. They all have that potential. Resentment and anger is at the top of the list. Fear and being cowardice is on the list. Self-pity is on the list. Self-justification, good codependent behavior right there. On the list, I got that one. Uh, self -import I got fear. Self-importance, ego, egotism. Self-condemnation and guilt, I had that one. Lying, evasiveness, and dishonesty, impatience. I don't have, I mean, yeah, I have that one times 100. I mean, you, you know all my 10 million Walmart stories of the Walmart, you know I got that. I mean, that's how it is. Like, I still think I'm gonna die in a Walmart someday. I really kind of do, but <laughs> hey. <laughs> That'd be bad, man. I don't wanna, I don't want that. Hate. Hate, false pride, phoniness, and denial, jealousy, envy, laziness, procrastination, insincerity, negative thinking, I had that, immoral thinking, perfectionism, been there, criticizing, loose talk, gossip. Those are like all the large you know, those, that's the large list of character defects. There's a much larger list of 300 and some that you can find in a variety of places, and you can, you can take a hard look at all of those. Here's a great quote. This is, um, this is out of the 12 and 12. This is the step that separates the men from the boys. So declares a well-loved clergyman who happens to be one of AA's greatest friends. He goes on to explain that any person capable of enough willingness and honesty to try repeatedly step six on all of his faults without any reservations whatsoever has indeed come a long way spiritually and is therefore entitled to be called a man or a woman who is sincerely trying to grow in their image and likeness of their own creator. The word that I think is so big in this step is, I become entirely ready. Because if I'm not entirely ready, what are my reservations? And I wanna talk about some of those reservations tonight. Like entirely ready means, do I have all the rooms in my life available? You know, like, you know how it is like if you have somebody come over to your house and you decide that you're gonna steer them in the direction of your um living room, your dining room, and your, I don't know, screen porch, because the rest of the house you have not cleaned up, your kitchen. Everybody always cleans up their kitchen. I don't know why. Do you ever, like sometimes I really think if you're gonna build a house, you should build a thousand square foot kitchen and everything else ought to be like 200 square feet. Because like every time people come to your house, where do they stand around? In the freaking kitchen, right? You can't get them anywhere else. You're like, you want to go, look, we got other rooms in our house. Would you like to see them? Everybody just huddles around the kitchen. Like, I don't know what people think is going to happen in the kitchen. Like, is somebody famous going to show up there or what? But tell me that's not true, right? 
So when God comes to your house, what rooms are really off limits to God? What parts of your life have you decided you're not willing to talk to God about, right? Those would be character defect rooms, wouldn't they? they those would be places where like, you really don't want God to go there, which makes zero sense spiritually. As if in those rooms, only you know what's there and God has been not privy to what exists in those rooms. We play that game with ourselves because we wanna look attractive to God, right? We wanna look as attractive to God as we possibly can, right? And the fact of the matter is, it takes me all the way back to the willingness of what rooms I'm willing to give to God goes all the way back to step three, doesn't it? It goes all the way back to how well do I believe God is loving me tonight? Do I believe that God's love for me tonight is unconditional? Do I believe that God's love for me tonight is complete? Do I believe that no matter where I took God in my, in my emotional house, he's gonna be more than satisfied with me, right? Because he might not disagree with me. I mean, he might not agree with what's in all of my rooms. Probably that's true, but he will love me in every one of those rooms. Do you see the difference? It's not like God's not gonna go, well, there's not work to be done here. There is work to be done in our rooms, but the work to be done in our rooms is gonna involve a God who A, loves us completely, not if we fix that room, but loves us completely, and B, is willing to go to work on our rooms with us, amen? So are all of my rooms available? That has to do with being entirely ready. When I'm entirely ready, I'm willing to return to my relationship with God as a creature, and I'm willing to be comfortable with knowing myself as a creature of God, right? I no longer feel the need to be in a competitive relationship with God. I no longer feel the need to be in a co-leader relationship with God where I've got to prop myself up to sort of function as my own God. I'm comfortable knowing that I'm not God tonight. I'm comfortable knowing that God is God and I'm not. And I'm comfortable with God knowing me as someone who's in his image, but is still functioning and living as a creature. You know, what it is, is I come to a place where I'm willing to accept the end of self. I come to a place where I'm willing to accept the end of self. You know, that's the third step, right? Turn my life and my will over to the care of God. I'm willing to let the, the self, the self of me come to an end, and I'm willing to realize that I now know myself in my relationship with God. I know the way that I'm married based on my relationship with God. I know the way that I parent based on my relationship with God. I know the way I'm your friend based on my relationship with God. Everything is based on my relationship with God and not my relationship with self. I even understand myself based on my relationship with God, right? I don't understand myself any longer Real freedom means I do not understand myself based on my own performance. I understand myself based on the value that God places on my life and the way that God loves me in Jesus, right? And now I'm really free because now self is unnecessary. You know, now I can understand who I am as a man or who I am as a woman in this entirely different way that is not, you know, completely independent, that is fully engaged in a relationship with God and more free than ever, more free than ever because of it. I'm entirely ready for this process of dealing with my character defects when if I asked you, let me ask you a question like this Saturday. If I told you that you were gonna spend this Saturday afternoon in a garlic press, you were gonna put yourself in a garlic press. Are you good with that? Like, are you good with that? Because like this character defect work, it is gonna have some garlic press capacity, isn't it? Because like, we're gonna see God begin to work on us and we're gonna see God begin to challenge us and we're gonna be God. You know, it's one thing to go, well, look at one of my character, I mean, one of my character defects is, you know, I have a lot of fear in my life. And so God begins to push in 
Well, let's talk about why you have fear, Mark. Well, I mean, like, do you think it could be that you have a lack of confidence in me as your, as your God? Do you think that you have a lack of confidence in me as your father? And I'm gonna go, think about the time that you were most afraid, he's gonna say to me. Was it true that you at that point in time were trying to still have confidence in yourself and your own ability to work something out or your own ability to save somebody else or whatever it was or all of that? Was it true that you were relying more on your own power than in confidence in the way that I loved you? The answer to that question would be yes. And the garlic press gets tighter. Let's talk, so you've kind of, you kind of moved past it. Let's talk about what you're afraid of now. Eight out of 10 Americans would tell you, and these are Christians, not Christians, whatever, that they have a legitimate fear of dying. A legitimate fear of dying. Let's press the garlic press. Do you believe, do you believe that when you die, I'm gonna be with you face to face? Do you believe I'm gonna be holding you in my arms when you die, yes or no? And the garlic press gets tighter. What else are you afraid of? Are you afraid of something happening to your children? Common fear, right? Well, yes, I am. Do you worry about your kids? Sure. Worry about your grandkids? I do. Why do you worry about them, Mark? Do you not think that I have them? Do you not think that I'm caring for them tonight? Do you not think that my arms are strong enough to hold them? And the answer to that question as the garlic press gets tighter is, you know what, God, right now I don't think that. And the garlic press gets tighter. These character defects, you know, it didn't like you, it didn't like you whitewash them over like there's graffiti and you whitewash over it. It's like the garlic press is much more accurate. Are you entirely ready? Are you entirely ready? Are you ready for life in the desert? Because man, sometimes when we remove our character defects, we are gonna be in a very awkward place trying to figure out how we're supposed to live without our go-tos, right? At one point, um, at one point in another career, I was teaching people, um, teaching people relational sales. So meaning I was working with a lot of banks and a lot of auto dealerships, and we were teaching auto dealerships how to stop using manipulative sales techniques, right? Especially with women, you know, like we were trying to teach these people, listen, women are high-end consumers of cars. Women are gonna buy cars again. If you rip off women when they're trying to buy a car, they're not gonna buy another car from you. You're gonna have to spend all this money to advertise to look for new clients because once you rip her off one time, you've made that one sale and you're satisfied. But the problem is, the weakness is, you have no repeat sales, right? So you're trying to teach people, instead of trying to put women in a car that they don't want, and that they don't need, would you please listen to what they're saying to you about the needs they have for a car, right? Like, I have two children, I have three children, I have this, I have that. Would you listen to what they're telling you they need, and would you help them to find the right car? This was a wild technique, and I would say to people like, even if you gotta go, we don't have that car, but Nissan does, help them find the Nissan. You should have seen, People were coming out of their minds, like, oh, if I, if I gotta sell cars like that, I quit. And I would go, you should. You should quit selling cars because in 10 years or less, you will not be able to do what you're doing right now. You should. You should sell cars based on telling people the truth, building a relationship with your buyer, and working to make sure that they will buy other cars from you. Why? Because you told them the truth and you created a value for them that was gonna make sense. Well, see, like for us, we're, we're men, just like those irritated salespeople that were getting into a whole new way to sell, we are gonna learn a whole new way of living in the desert because our character defects for a lot of us have been our go-tos, right? We have learned how to manipulate other people with our character defects. We have learned how to create a false sense of safety with our character defects. We have learned to get people to be sort of afraid of us with our character defects. We have bossed people around with them. We have gotten our way. We have done a lot of stuff 
with our character defects that have, it looks like winning for us. And so God comes in and he's like, are you sure you want me to do this surgery? I want you to understand the outcome. Because when I do this surgery and remove some of your go-tos, guess what's gonna happen? You're gonna feel like you're out in the desert. You're gonna feel like you're out in the desert. And you're gonna struggle with that. Are we entirely ready? Are we entirely ready to hear what God, the truth about what God says about me? If I'm entirely ready, here's what God says about me tonight. He says, I'm deeply loved. He says, I'm completely forgiven. He says, I'm fully pleasing to him. He says, I'm totally accepted. He says, I'm complete in Christ. That's what he says. Are you ready to hear that? Are you entirely ready to allow God to love you that way? That comes out of um, Search for Significance. McGee, we have that book in our office. Are you ready to allow God to love you fully? Are you ready to allow God to love you completely? Are you entirely ready? This character defects step is a big deal. It's, I mean, it's a step you can work on. You can work on it in group. You can work on it with your sponsor. You can work on it in therapy. You can do all those things at once. Every one of those things at once. The results are gonna be surprising for all of us. They're gonna be very surprising for all of us. I have been amazed by some of the stuff that has happened in my life when I have really done the work on codependent stuff just in primary relationships to see what happens and to realize the stuff that I've been the most afraid of has really been the fear of being out of control in a relationship and the fear of going, who am I gonna pick? Like, am I gonna pick my own techniques and abilities to manage a relationship? Or am I gonna use maybe like the Holy Spirit? What is it I have the most confidence in? Well, in codependency, there's a steady diet of going, well, I mean, I don't really wanna say it this way because it sounds bad, me, <laughs> right? I have more confidence in me. It's like, wait a minute, you have, you have more confidence in you than you do in the Holy Spirit. And the answer to that question in active codependency is, yes, I do. <laughs> it's like, we gotta think about that. What happens when we go, God, I'm let, I want you to remove that character defect of control. Well, then I'm gonna be in the desert and then I'm gonna have to watch God move and it's gonna be like that steady diet of the people of God when they were wandering around in the desert, right? That was not a lovely experience for them. What do they have to do? They had to do stuff they didn't wanna do. They had to follow God by a fire every day. They didn't wanna do that. Number two, they had to wait on God to show them where living water was. They didn't wanna do that. Number three, they had to have a steady diet of chicken and bread, chicken and bread, chicken and bread, chicken and bread. It's like, look it up. It wasn't really chicken and bread, but it was close to it. That's why I think personally, that is where Chick-fil-A started making billions of dollars. <laughs> because Chick-fil-A goes, those suckers for 40 years, they ate chicken and bread. What happens if we put a sandwich together and we call it the Chick-fil-A sandwich and we open up little restaurants all the Christians are gonna to flock to the place like maniacs, even though I think it's only an average place myself. They have good shakes, but anyway. And then all the Christians are gonna come there because why? They've heard the story in the Old Testament about chicken and bread. We close it on Sunday, it'll even be better, right? God, that's such a good marketing scheme for Chick-fil-A. I gotta like, I gotta get that to my friend that works for them, man. <laughs> Are we ready? Are we ready for what's gonna happen in our lives when we tell God, go to work on the stuff that is binding me up right now tonight? What would happen? You gotta ask yourself that question. What would happen? What do you think's gonna happen? It's like, I, I just don't know how to tell my husband the truth about A. I don't know how to tell my wife the truth about B. What do you think's gonna happen? 
Well, I don't know, but every time I've ever shared something like that, he's lost his mind. It's like, okay, it's his mind. Let him lose it, and let's see what he does as the corrective if you stay completely out of it. I just scared every codependent completely out of their mind. You're gonna have a big class tonight, Lori. You'll be in there three hours, amen? <laughs> Here's the scripture, I think, for this step. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is anything offensive in the way of me and lead me in the way of life everlasting. There's freedom. Our character defects is every possible avenue that the enemy can use to keep you from A, being free, B, being sober, and C, being in a incredibly strong relationship with God, amen? And the work is, are you ready for the surgery? We'll talk about what the surgery looks like next week when we ask God to get started. But man, I just wanna thank you for being here. Let's pray, sweet Jesus. Thank you for this time of preparation to look again at this word of willingness on our parts and availability on our parts and an understanding of what it means to be held and bound up in ourselves. Come and set us free. In Jesus' sweet name, amen. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardships as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is, not as I would have it, trusting that he will make all things right if I surrender to his will, and that I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him in the next. Amen.